Ready? Okay, I see there are still people trickling in, but nevertheless, we have to get started so that we keep our time slot. I would like to welcome to this year's Svertrup Lecture. My name is Peter Schlosser. I'm the president of the, the outgoing president of the Ocean Sciences section. With me, co-chairing the session, is Jim Murray, who is the incoming president of the Ocean Sciences section. And it's a great pleasure to present to you Lisa Levine from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who will deliver the Svertrup Lecture. For those of you who are not familiar with the Svertrup uh, Lecture and, and Svertrup uh, himself, I just prepared a few slides to give you a bit background of background. So first uh, to the lecture. The uh, Svertrup Lecture is part of a union-wide lecture series, the so-called Bowie Lectures. And uh, the series is named and was inaugurated in 1989 and was named after the first uh, president of uh, HEU. The uh, Ocean Sciences section designates each year's Svertrup lecturer, and uh, it is one of the highest recognitions that the Ocean Sciences section uh, gives to its members. Now, a little bit about uh, uh, Harald uh, Ulrich Svertrup. He is a Norwegian, was born in 1888, um, he started to work with uh, Björknes in Oslo. A lot of you probably know Björknes from his climate work. And that was in 1911. Then he moved to Leipzig, where he spent uh, time between 1913 and 1917. And then he uh, went on to a polar expedition with uh, Amundsen uh, between 1918 and 25. Became chair of the meteorology department in Bergen, Norway, also a well-known place for oceanography and meteorology. And in uh, 1931, uh, he became research professor in the Christian Michelson Institute. He spent some time at the uh, Carnegie Institute in, in Washington, in Washington in, at around 1930. And then that's where a lot of people know him uh, for best between 1936 and 48. He was the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, so a, a clear connection to our today's uh, speaker. He moved back to Norway in 1948, where he became the director of the Norwegian Polar Institute and also a professor of geophysics in Oslo, and uh, he died in 1957. So I just want to show you a few snippets of his uh, illustrious uh, career. He was, uh, of course, uh, in the typical tradition of many Scandinavians, he, he was the explorer. And uh, here you see him behind uh, the white uh, dog on the moat for the uh, Amundsen um, expedition. And um, he uh, also, although a lot of people that you, that you talk to think he actually was more a theoretician, he, wa he was really uh, deeply rooted in ocean observations. And he um, said, you know, it would, it would be extremely valuable for me to spend a number of years in close contact with the events in nature and with the opportunity to get fully acquainted with various techniques of observation. He said that after he had worked on data for quite a while. And then he added, just before uh, going on to the um, Amundsen expedition, and I did not mind the adventure. So he took a great, uh, uh, you know, pleasure in being out there. Uh, his time at uh, Scripps, here you see Scripps Pier, He's, he uh, spent a lot of time on the research vessel Scripps, and he also worked uh, closely with uh, Walter Monk and others on issues that, that were relevant to many things, including uh, the issue of surf, which sort of was used by the military quite heavily during World War II. He was somebody who early on recognized that interdisciplinarity is, is important, and uh, he said, you know, this, that uh, every oceanographer should uh, leave, uh, should have some basic knowledge on, on, uh, of the fields of all the marine sciences. And he said, partly because he should be able, at that time it was he, it was not uh, she or he, uh, he should be able to recognize results within his area, uh, his own field, which have a bearing on problems of others or to know where he may obtain information that has a bearing on his own. So that was uh, actually early on that, this, uh, that he brought out this one. He's known 
by many for the Bible of Oceanography. And uh, what that is, it's uh, his uh, monumental work that he completed with uh, Martin Johnson and Richard Fleming called The Oceans, their physics, chemistry, and marine biology. And of course, that also showed his holistic approach to uh, ocean sciences. Here is a, a sketch of uh, the, some of them dictating to uh, the uh, secretary who, who typed the, the manuscript, which then you see these pages flying out of the typewriter into a nebulous uh, space in which it was assembled to this great work. Uh, he's probably best known for his uh, dynamics, and this was laid down uh, first in his 1947 paper, Wind Driven Currents in a Baroclinic Ocean. And that, of course, laid out the link between meridional currents and the curl of the wind stress. And it was a foundation for large-scale modeling of the ocean, which was picked up uh, later on by many uh, people, including Walter Monk and Henry uh, Stommel. And uh, Walter Monk, in a, a biography, uh, writes, it is remarkable that Svertrup derived what is known as Svertrup dynamics, not by mathematical manipulation, in parentheses, which is easy enough, but by analysis of observations, which Monk sees as the trademark of Svertrup. So let me now introduce our Svertrup lecturer, uh, Lisa Levine. She's a professor in biological oceanography and uh, it, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and there in the Integrative Oceanography Division. She's also director of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. She has diverse scientific uh, interests, and you can read them. I will not go through all of it, uh, but among them, population and com community ecology, and there was, was emphasis on uh, methane uh, seeps, oxygen minimum zones, ecology, life history evolution, uh, function of restored um, and invaded ecosystems, and species invasion, etc. So you can see she covers a lot of ground, and you will see that in her lecture. Uh, Lisa is a fellow of uh, AAAS. Uh, she works in, in many functions, such as uh, working group steering committees of uh, SCORE. Um, she is, has uh, served in, in multiple um, uh, ways as editor for Limnology and Oceanography, for an HEU book series, for deep sea research, etc. She's on advisory boards, NRC panels, and um, participated in 35 uh, cruises, and there she, I think, you heavily uses uh, submersibles and uh, remotely operated uh, vehicles. So before uh, asking uh, Lisa to the podium, I would now like to ask uh, Jim to uh, present Lisa with uh, the certification of recognition. Uh, Lisa, I'm pleased to give you this document, and it's a uh, sign from Peter. Thank you. And uh, it's great. You can frame it for your office. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and uh, I think that I, this will be the first Sverdrup lecture that addresses the bottom of the ocean, the animals on the bottom of the ocean. And I'm hoping that I will be able to convince you by the end of this hour that they are, in fact, important and worth thinking about. All right, let's see how this goes. Uh, and I want to start with a set of acknowledgments. The visuals are hard to see here. I'm going to have to look at the screen a bit. but. Uh, I, I want to thank all of you for staying so long in this meeting and for coming to a talk on Friday afternoon. I want to thank the Ocean Sciences section for the honor of, of giving this award, uh, presentation. I want to thank the many collaborators who've worked with me in the deep sea over the years. You guys, if any of you are out there, you know who you are. And the many students, uh, postdocs, and other affiliated people in my lab who've worked with me. And then I also want to thank all the authors who's uh, figures I've clipped out of their papers for this presentation, in case any of you are in the audience. Oop, let me go back to the funding agents. 
It is important to know that there are a handful of funding agencies out there that actually support research into the uh, biology of the seafloor, of the deep seafloor. So thank you for that. So today I want to talk about the largest habitat on Earth. This is the deep ocean below 200 meters. This comprises something like two-thirds of the surface area of our planet. And, uh, and we've seen remarkably little of it, something like 5%, maybe less. And as a result, the majority of the species that inhabit this realm uh, remain undescribed. Now, I'm going to focus this afternoon on continental margins. Uh, the area between about 200 and 3,000 meters, it extends around the globe for over 150,000 kilometers. And when you see it on a plot like this, it, it looks kind of, these skinny red lines are not so impressive. Let's see if I can get my pointer pointed and working here. Yeah, oh, there we go. Oops. Let me not laser you. All right, so the continental margins, um, actually, if we think about them in terms of jurisdiction and the 200-mile limit outside of each country, they actually fill a considerable area of the ocean. That's the blue you see up there. And then for those countries that have signed on to the law of the sea, they've claimed additional continental shelf. That's the orange. So when you put all that together, it's really a significant fraction of our ocean. And in today's presentation, um, I want to cover really three topics. I want to start talking about the biodiversity of the deep sea and how our understanding of this has changed in recent years and how we've come to recognize a host of important services and functions that that biodiversity provides. I then want to focus on, the, on hydrography and its effect on biodiversity and in particular look at upwelling margins looking at uh, taking a, a more detailed discussion of oxygen and pH on the margins and then how this is changing um, over time. And then the third topic I want to look at is more direct human impacts and uh, that human footprint and how it combines with climate change and biodiversity to create a need for stewardship on continental margins. So let me start at the beginning. And the beginning of the field of deep sea biology really was, can be set at about 150 years ago. At that time, uh, a communications cable was hauled up from the Mediterranean covered with sea creatures. And since it was put down bare, um, people realized that, in fact, that was from 1,000 meters. People realized there must be life in the deep sea. Prior to that time, the going paradigm was that the deep sea was azoic and lifeless. So for the next 100 years or so, there were many great national deep sea expeditions. The Challenger expedition was the most important of those. And the picture of the deep sea that emerged was one uh, of a very cold, dark, salty, high pressure realm. People believe, scientists believe the seafloor was covered with mud, that it was very homogeneous, very stable, uh, quiescent, and that the animals that lived down there were food limited. Um, but over the last 40 years, uh, oh, and I should say that this is how the deep sea was depicted and the continental margins in particular were depicted in textbooks as flat, featureless uh, slopes. But over the last 40 years, we've developed a host of new exploration tools. Many of you will recognize these or have used these. And um, we have things like multi-beam sonar and acoustics for midwater. We have human-operated vehicles, AUVs, ROVs, and uh, camera sleds. And with the use of these, a different, very different picture of the continental margins has emerged. And now we recognize them as being highly heterogeneous. We recognize that there are terrestrial influences, bringing in nutrients, bringing sediments and energy that cuts the margin into canyons. We recognize influences from deep inside the earth, earthquakes, there are tectonic activity, earthquakes, mudslides, and, and there is a lot of fluid seepage containing methane and other hydrogen, other compounds that affects the seafloor. And then we have atmospheric and oceanographic influences, wind that drives upwelling, that creates, stimulates production and leads to the development of 
hydrographic heterogeneity, low oxygen features, high CO2 features. So we have now margins that are, are very heterogeneous. We know they're cut by hundreds, it, probably thousands of canyons. We know that the sea floor has seamounts, some on margins, some not, whoops, let me go back. We, we know that there are tens of thousands of seamounts, probably actually hundreds of seamounts on the sea floor. We know that the animals that live on the deep floor can create geomorphic features themselves. So deep water corals will create large mounds, uh, kilometers long on, on the seabed. And even sponges create massive reach, reef structures. Over the last 35 years, we've discovered a series of ecosystems that are reliant on chemosynthesis rather than photosynthesis. Hydrothermal vents, discovered in, first in 1975, are the first of these, but since then we've discovered on our margins many methane seeps. We've also found organic falls, dead whale carcasses, and uh, wood that supports chemosynthesis-based communities, very similar to those at hydrothermal vents. So there's a tremendous amount of habitat heterogeneity out there. And we know this heterogeneity supports a wealth of biodiversity. And I want to show you just a few examples of the a truly strange and amazing uh, creatures that we have discovered. We've found animals that can live in the hottest known waters. At hydrothermal vents, we have avalanellid polychaetes colonizing at 85 degrees centigrade and living happily at 45 or 55 degrees centigrade. These are the highest heat tolerances known. At methane seeps, we have some of the most sulfitic sediments out on the planet. Uh, a consortia, microbial consortia of, of bacteria and archaea uh, act to carry out methane, anaerobic methane oxidation that yields sulfide levels of 5, 10, or 15, sometimes 20 millimolar in sediments. And living happily in those sediments are a host of worms. These are Dorvaleid polychaetes, which are amazingly tolerant to those high sulfide levels. And uh, each, each has slightly different diet, as indicated by different stable isotope signatures. And the most amazing of these is this Dorvaleid species here. It lives inside carbonate rocks that are precipitated by this microbial consortia. And this may be the world's first archivore, animal that lives primarily off archaea. And it's reflected in its stable carbon isotope signature with a, a delta C13 value of minus 91. It's deriving most of its nutrition from carbon fixed by archaea, which have very, very isotopically light lipids. Uh, methane seeps also host these yeti crabs. They're amazing crabs. They're basically waving their claws that are covered with bacteria. This will cycle again. Um, they're gardening the bacteria offering them um, sulfide and removing waste with the waving motion and then eating off the bacteria, uh, as you can see here. And this is, this is a great example of how um, bacteria can actually govern the behavior of animals in the deep sea. If we slide, those are from off Costa Rica. If we go down, those were 1,000 meters. If we go down uh, to about 1,850 meters, we find a place where seamounts are subducting on the margin and uh, there are warm, shimmering fluids e coming out, and uh, they're methane-rich. This is an environment that is really pretty much part hydrothermal vent and part methane seep. I call it a hydrothermal seep, and it supports very, very high productivity with tube worm bushes the size of cars, such as the one you see here. And then uh, finally on... Uh, also on margins, along whale migration routes, we have dead whales falling uh, to the seafloor, decaying, and then hosting an entire another ecosystem after they're dead, including these, uh, probably the most odd of the organisms are ossidacs, these whale worms. These worms colonize the whale bones, burrow in, and then symbiotic bacteria in the roots like structures on the worms are, are heterotrophic and they're able to use the whalebone lipids to, uh, to obtain energy. And this goes on for many tens, maybe a hundred years after the whale itself dies. Beyond the wonder of all these strange 
types of organisms and all the biodiversity out there, we've come to realize that this biodiversity supports a broad range of ecosystem services and functions. Uh, probably most familiar to people are the provisioning functions. We take food, we take energy, we're starting to get pharmaceuticals um, and poised to mine minerals out of the seafloor. But beyond the market value of the deep sea, there are many very important support functions that it provides. It provides substrate for attachment, nursery grounds, refugia, and food chain support for animals. We've come to discover just recently that many of the habitats I've shown you provide important nursery functions. Sponges in the Aleutian Islands support rockfish, so do sea, uh, larvae, so do sea pens. It turns out they're all full of tiny little fish larvae. Um, obtaining refuge and among the stinging cells. Uh, coral, Gorgonian corals support a, a wealth of biodiversity. And we've just discovered recently that methane seeps serve as nursery grounds for skates and rays in places as diverse as Chile and the Mediterranean. Perhaps they're obtaining refuge from the high, at using the high sulfide levels there. Um, perhaps the most important functions provided by the continental margins are what we call regulating functions. They play key roles in nutrient cycling, nitrogen in particular. It's thought that margins um, are responsible for something like 50% of the biological pump and that as much as 90% of the organic carbon that's accumulated on the seafloor occurs on our continental margins. We know also, especially the this audience knows how important these are for scientific research. They provide space for communication cables and the internet. And they also, margins and the deep sea in general has many aesthetic functions. They are, uh, are a source of inspiration for film, for literature, and even art. And here I share with you um, some artwork by Lily Simonson, who, uh, and a Los Angeles artist who's been very inspired by ye the Yeti crabs. So that's the the first part about biodiversity, and now I'd like to turn your attention to hydrography, and I'd like to talk about hydrography, how hydrography influences biodiversity on margins. And in particular, I'd like to focus on oxygen. The regions you see here in blue are areas of low oxygen, uh, midwater low oxygen, and they result from upwelling, which stimulates production. That primary production sinks and degrades, and oxygen is depleted at depths typically from about 100 to 1,000 meters. And uh, a profile through these low oxygen regions looks something like this. I can't hardly see it over there, but um, the top few hundred meters, oxygen declines very sharply. There's a core region of very low oxygen, and then it starts up again gradually in deep water. And where these um, oxygen, midwater, low oxygen features intercept the continental margin, we have a band of hypoxic seafloor, low oxygen on the seabed. Uh, there's over one million square kilometers of this that occurs naturally along continental margins. But these are not dead zones. There are, in fact, animals flourishing and living here, and they have an amazing array of adaptations. They all have red blood hemoglobin, or many of them, I should say, have uh, hemoglobin with high oxygen affinity, so the animals look bright red. Uh, many of the animals have elaborate uh, enhanced surface areas in the form of fuzzy f or frilly gill structures. Even the fish have uh, very frilly gills in this region. Uh, and another strategy is to be long and thin and to have a high surface area to volume ratio to enhance oxygen uptake. And one of my favorite examples of a long, thin worm is this small oligochaete, Olavius crassic, oh, let's see, I've already blanked on the name. Crassitunicatus, there we go. Uh, and it lives at 300 meters in a basin off Peru where the oxygen concentrations are on the order of one micromolar. And this is a gutless oligochaete. It has no mouth, gut, or anus. It doesn't feed, but instead it hosts beneath its cuticle uh, six different bacterial types that carry out sulfate reduction, sulfite oxidation. There are spirochetes probably fixing nitrogen. And so these bacteria are feeding the worm. They're removing waste. They're pretty much doing everything that this worm needs to live. 
And the other remarkable thing about this worm is it's, it's pretty active. It's not actually that small. It's about a centimeter long. And the sediments where it lives are completely bioturbated, even though the worm is not feeding technically, and there's almost no oxygen there. So oxygen has quite a few different kinds of, of effects on the structure and function of communities. Um, most of the communities that occur in low oxygen zones have uh, very high dominance. They're largely comprised of a handful of species, often oligochaetes or annelids. Um, the oxygen gradients in oxygen minimum zones also produce quite a broad range of zonation. In the core region, we often have protozoa, like foraminifera dominating. Um, and as oxygen increases just slightly, we pick up smaller macrofaunal animals. And just below that, we pick up high densities of mobile megafauna. And just below that, we pick up the um, the mobile necton fishes. And so each of these is increasing in body size. They each have different oxygen tolerance thresholds, and each probably benefits from the absence of the larger predator. That's why we see these density maxima. Now, across very small oxygen gradients at this lower transition here, um, we have huge changes in diversity as reflected by this rarefaction curve. Only one macrofaunal species occurs at 800 meters, and then as we go deeper, very gradually, the diversity increases. And if we look at X radiographs of those same sediments, we find that that diversity translates into huge changes in bioturbation. So at 700, 800 meters, the sediments are fully laminated. We start to pick up burrows, and by 1,100 meters, with just about a five micromolar change in oxygen, we pass thresholds and the sediments are fully bioturbated. There are also many functional consequences of low oxygen. I've worked with um, colleagues from the UK to do C13 labeled uh, experiment, a C13 labeled diatom shipboard experiments, in which we found that at very low oxygen levels, protozoans dominate the uptake and processing of particulate organic carbon. When oxygen levels increase, it's the macrofauna that dominate, the uh, invertebrate animals that get more of the carbon. And we have actually seen that happen on the shelf. Pre-monsoon, the sediments are oxygenated, the macrofauna dominate. Post-monsoon, oxygen goes way down, the protozoans take over. And we see something similar with across different um, depths with different oxygen levels. I've also conducted a series of colonization experiments with Japanese colleagues on the, uh, om on the India margin. And what we found is that ox oxygen can have a large effect on the recovery or resilience of communities. When we put out trays at uh, 500 meters, nobody colonized. There's no macrofauna around there. The oxygen levels are about 0.1 micromolar, very, very low. At 800 meters, we got a little bit of colonization, despite a fairly large background community. Um, at 1,100 meters, where oxygen is yet another order of magnitude higher, 20 micromolar, we see not only high colonization, but an overshoot of the background density. So it looks like oxygen has some control on community resilience. So all of the patterns that I've shown you thus far are based on interpreting stations uh, and, and the communities there in light of the oxygen gradients. But we know that oxygen minimum zones are also carbon maximum zones, or we can think of them as pH minimum zones. And so you can see these profiles from different parts of the Eastern Pacific show very clearly that pH varies with oxygen. They're both low at these midwater levels. And a work by Paul May has also shown very uh, well, uh, documented in terms of DIC, that there is a carbon maximum in these OMZs, or oxygen minimum zones, and it falls just below the oxygen minimum layer. So with increasing interest in the role of CO2 in terms of the ecology of the ocean, I've sort of tried to reconsider how we might think about oxygen minimum zone benthos. And I've worked with my student, Christina Frieder, to go back and retrospectively look at oxygen minimum zone cross-margin benthic transects. And we've considered the three primary climate stressors, CO2, oxygen, and temperature. 
uh, and collected data where we could find all of those together, as well as benthic community data for 24 stations ranging from about 100 to 3,400 meters and over a range of oxygen uh, levels, and ask the question using variance partitioning, which, which stressors contribute to variance in species diversity, in density, and taxonomic composition. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the methods, but we used random forest variance partitioning. And what I found, or we found, was that to our surprise, it was really temperature at least, that was the master variable accounting for most of the variance, at least in, in the case of diversity, species evenness, and species density. And these partial dependence plots show that there are, in fact, really strong uh, temperature thresholds at around eight degrees that affect these values. And also oxygen was quite important for species diversity as well. We asked the same question for the taxonomic representation and found that, in fact, there were two taxa, uh, crustaceans, uh, I'm sorry, echinoderms and polychaetes for which uh, PCO2 was sort of the dominant variable explaining variance with oxygen a close second for the polychaetes. Um, and, but that for mollusks and crustaceans, crustaceans that temperature was in fact the dominating variable and oxygen and CO2 were not particularly important. Again, you can see really strong thresholds here, four degrees and eight degree thresholds for these taxa. These are all data from upwelling margins, so across oxygen minimum zones. Now, all, everything I've shown you so far has treated these stations and environments as uh, being static hydrographically. I've assigned values to each station, but we know that oxygen and pH on continental margins uh, can be, in fact, quite dynamic. And I just want to give you an example from Southern California which, where these factors have been well studied. We find variability in um, oxygen and pH on very long time scales. These are oxygen anomalies from the Cal Coffee data set from paper by McClatchy. Looks like there might be cycles that last uh, 50 years, regime scale type variations. We have a uh, very strong influence of ENSO cycles, so interdecadal variation in oxygen and pH is a result of La Nina and El Nino. We have seasonal upwelling winds on the margin off Southern California, so we have seasonal fluctuations in oxygen and pH. And then those same winds produce um, event scale, one to two week low oxygen, low pH events. We also have semi-diurnal tides that create a lot of oxygen and pH fluctuation just over six hour time scales. So we have very dynamic conditions, but superimposed on all of this natural invariability are some long-term changes. And we believe, and this is still a subject of study, that much of this can be, the long-term change can be attributed to CO2 in the atmosphere. We know that carbon dioxide entering the ocean from the atmosphere is causing what we call ocean acidification. It's also warming the atmosphere, which warms the ocean. Warmer water holds less oxygen, but also that warmer wa um, atmosphere is melting the uh, glaciers and ice caps and enhancing stratification in the ocean. And that with enhanced stratification, we have less vertical mixing and ventilation of oxygen into deep water. And that is creating a phenomenon we call deoxygenation. Now, another effect of the warming seems to be increasing upwelling winds, the temperature differential between the sea and the land. And so we have enhanced upwelling of that low oxygen water onto our shelves in upwelling areas. And, um, and also due to lower ventilation, we have an expansion of our oxygen minimum zones, both upward and downward. So what evidence do we have that all of this is actually occurring? Well, some of the longest term data come from the North Pacific at Station P. There are a lot of fluctuations, but there's a long term decline in oxygen since the 1950s. And it looks like we're there losing oxygen at about two thirds of a micromolar per year. The Cal Coffee data set off Southern California also shows declines in oxygen o over the last 20, uh, 22 years the region between 200 and 300 meters has lost 20 to 30 percent of its oxygen. So that's quite a lot. And the hypoxic boundary, which we define as 60 micromolar, has been shoaling. Inshore, it's been shoaling by nearly 100 meters. 
uh, Strama et al. in 2008 produced a provocative paper that showed at six stations with long-term oxygen data that oxygen minimum zones are expanding. These are the blue areas you see here and the upper and lower boundaries are, are showing and deepening. And that same group um, looked more synthetically at the ocean over many areas and in fact this phenomenon is widespread between the 1960s and the 1990s and 2000s. There's been a significant decline in oxygen over this broad swath of tropical and subtropical waters. These are midwater declines be here between 200 and 700 meters. And it, uh, this is increase in apparent oxygen utilization and decline in oxygen concentrations. And so there's a, a much larger surface area of the ocean now that has uh, hypoxic conditions. Well, what are the ecological consequences of this? Now, scientists are just beginning to study this, and uh, some of what I'm going to show you is, and you have to excuse my poor animations, but uh, they're what we think we know. Midwater species often migrate vertically. They're down in the oxygen minimum zone by day, and at night they come up to feed and repay their oxygen debt. Well, those same animals, as oxygen minimum zones expand, are going to have to swim further up to get to sufficient oxygen. Um, uh, but they might re be compressed from above by waters with enhanced CO2 uh, uh, that are also warmer. So we call this phenomenon habitat compression. It keeps animal densities higher, and um, the thought is that makes them more susceptible to predation. It turns out the mctophid fishes off Southern California have declined dramatically in recent years, and Tony Koslow has hypothesized that this is a result of habitat compression and increased predation um, on those fishes, especially at night. Another kind of fish that's subject to this habitat compression are the large bill fishes, uh, things like uh, sailfish and, and marlin. They have very high oxygen demands and it's been shown in the Pacific and the Atlantic that they are being pushed up into shallower and shallower waters, tropical waters, as the oxygen minimum zones expand. And this makes them much more susceptible to overfishing. This picture of a persane here off Panama has got something like 300 of these giant fish in one fishing event. But not all animals are negatively affected by habitat compression. There are some animals that like low oxygen, and, and the um, Humboldt squid, or sometimes called the giant squid, Docidicus, is one of these. It's, it's expanded its range tremendously um, up into uh, Washington, Canada, and even Alaska, uh, with probably some major changes in the food web as a result. Now, in terms of ground fishes, there's pretty good evidence for habitat compression. Um, for those fishes that um, are unable to tolerate hypoxic levels of 60 micromolar or more, Whitney and Sinclair have hypothesized that they are going to lose something like 50% of their vertical range off California and off British Columbia and Alaska from shoaling of the oxygen minimum zones. Uh, and this already happened off Oregon, where they have seasonal dead zones or hypoxic events every summer. Now, those are effects of low oxygen, but there are other climate change effects that are going to take place on margins and in the deep sea, and one of these possible effects, uh, is that going? Yep, my movie's going, um, is the dissociation of gas hydrates. The margins are full of gas hydrates buried just under the sediments. You can see the blue dots there represent some of the known deposits. And um, it's felt that as the water warms that this is going to increase the release of methane. And there's a fairly provocative paper by Frampus and Hornbach that came out very recently that suggests that warming of the Gulf Stream and moving of its position may dissociate as much as 2.5 gigatons of gas hydrate just in that area. I should mention gas hydrate is like a frozen form of methane for those of you not familiar with it. So, you know, likely some, this is a, a movie from Hydrate Ridge off Oregon, but there are many, many places where we might see more hydrate entering the water. Some of it may get to the atmosphere with major feedbacks, and we've hypothesized that these types of events have occurred with dramatic effects in the past. Another type of climate change effect is the lowering of the ocean's carbonate saturation state. We know um, that Currently, the Atlantic has much higher 
aragonite saturation levels than the Pacific, and what, as those levels drop due to ocean acidification, we may be looking at loss of our deep water um, calcifying corals that form so much structure um, on the seabed, and they may be replaced with the types of corals that abound in our oxygen minimum zones. There's lots of corals, but uh, they don't form reefs and they don't have any calcium carbonate on them. Okay, so, so those are some of the effects of, of added CO2 in the atmosphere, but beyond those effects, humans are having increasingly uh, larger footprint with more direct interactions on margins. And uh, I'll talk about some of these extractive activities for energy, for food, um, and soon mining, as well as uh, some of the disposal and debris d deposition that's going on. So let's start with fishing. We have depleted a lot of our shallow water fish resources and fishermen are going deeper and deeper. And so it's routine now to collect fish from, and this just reflects this deepening over time, it's routine to collect fish from 1,000 meters or more. Now the fish that live down there grow very slowly. They have um, long maturation times and so it's very unlikely that once those fish are depleted or overfished that they are going to recover very easily. Um, beyond the fishing, there's a lot of gear that gets snagged and, um, and left on the seafloor, and some of that gear continues to collect fish, even though nobody comes to recover them. We call that ghost fishing. Uh, and then we have bycatch. This is the catch of fishes that are not targeted by the fishery, and there are huge amounts of both invertebrates and fishes that are collected in deep water as bycatch. And in fact, this is such a severe problem that uh, it turns out in, a, in the North Atlantic, the, of the most abundant 15 deep water species, nine of them have reached endangered status without ever being targeted as a fishery, simply as a result of take from bycatch. Now, some fishing occurs as trawling, and this is perhaps the most destructive of fishing activities. Some places trawling's banned, but in many places it's going great guns, and trawling on the seabed the biggest effect is to take this nice three-dimensional structure that we now know is so important as nursery habitat trophic support and basically turn it into a barren flat rubble ground. And this is happening along many of our margins. This came home to me just how severe this problem was and how we may be removing things that we don't even know about. When I was off New Zealand in 2006, we were exploring for methane seeps. We discovered nine new seeps, the very first New Zealand had ever found on its margin, and every single one of them had signs of trawl activity. There were either trawl marks or lost gear or coral rubble out there. And when we went back and collected the fishing records, all those little pluses on this diagram, we found extensive trawling. One of our sites had been trawled over 200 times. So this is an example of, of trawling and losing um, a wealth of, it, of novel information before, it, before you discover it. But we don't have to go to the southern hemisphere to find these cases. The very productive Bering Sea hosts many canyons on its margin, and the Pribilof Canyon is just starting to be explored. There's lots of biodiversity down there, but also there are lots of trawl marks. There's the Pollock fishery, probably the nation's largest fishery is going on there and uh, there's lost gear, and so uh, you know, we do run the risk of damaging and losing species before we ever discover them. Now in terms of oil and gas extraction, we're taking oil and gas deeper and deeper. It can be quite a complex operation. This diagram of the 5,000 or so oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico makes very clear that we started shallow and been moving into deeper and deeper water. The most famous of these deep water rigs is probably the Deepwater Horizon. You're all familiar with it. And in 2010, that rig you know, released a lot of, of accident, released a lot of oil. And so we have scenes of things like oil covered corals down on the deep sea floor. So we know what can happen when we drill very deep. And I guess I have to say that we are starting out uh, a lot of drilling, uh, poised to do a lot of drilling in the Arctic. This lease site 193 sits right adjacent to Barrow Canyon. 
a potentially a very productive, diverse canyon that uh, we really haven't explored at all. That canyon is known for its very high concentrations of crustaceans, and the bowhead whales that feed on these are subsistence support for the Aleut populations of Point Barrow. And so, you know, we are sort of poised to have some sort of major oil issue to think about. And these are certainly things that we have to be thinking about and preparing for. Now, another type of extraction activity that we're just poised to carry out is deep sea mining. And uh, one of the targets of interest are marine phosphates. This is a kind of emerging resource that's associated with coastal upwelling. The bacteria that form in oxygen minimum zones on the seabed sequester phosphate and make very high concentrations. And uh, Namibia actually is the country that's maybe set to be the first to mine its phosphate resources between about 100 and 300 meters, and they've leased out huge tracts of seabed for phosphate mi subtidal phosphate mining. Um, it just so happens that that same seabed um, the, and those interests target the major fishery habitat for that country. The bacteria that occur all over the sea floor are, and the worms in there are fed on by bearded gobies, which then migrate up and are fed on by hake and horse mackerel, which are Namibia's largest fisheries. And those then support a very productive uh, marine mammal and bird set of bird populations. Um, and it's the mining and fishing are, uh, are organized and uh, ruled over by different agencies, and so uh, they've only just started to talk to each other, and at this point they're quite in quite a bit of conflict. But this just gives you an example of the type of multi-sectoral issues that will be faced uh, on our margins. So, well, what's really hot in mining is hydrothermal vents. There are um, recognition now that seafloor massive sulfides at hot vents have a lot of precious um, elements, minerals, gold, silver, zinc, lead, copper, things like that. And um, I can't actually, I don't, just see if I can read it all from here. Yeah, barely. Um, and the, the areas that have been targeted for this, the first is the West Pacific and Papua New Guinea and, and the island nations around there. But the International Seabed Authority has also leased out uh, areas on the Southwest Indian Ridge and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge to a whole host of countries for mining the deep sea. Um, as I mentioned, Papua New Guinea was targeted to be the first they were planning to mine next year, but there have been some setbacks. These are within their EEZ, and I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen. But beyond that mining, we also have a mine tailings from land being deposited uh, into the deep sea as sort of a, people believe it's an inert area, so our continental margins are being covered with terrestrial tailings. Many of them have toxic compounds. And uh, Papua New Guinea and those uh, Western Pacific Islands, are, as well as Norway, are places where we find this going on. So we are uh, looking at uh, an ocean that is faced with climate change issues. This is sort of a very crude biogeography of where we expect to find the worst of the warming, the worst of lowered pH and low oxygen happening, and all of these will affect the organisms and their resilience and their ability to be able to recover from the kinds of disturbances that are being created by our fishing activities in deep water, by our energy extraction, and, and by the mining that might well go on. And there are other kinds of mining, manganese nodules, for example, that I haven't really had a chance to talk about. So what is it that we uh, need to do to attain that maintain the integrity of our deep sea ecosystems. Now, this is not an easy task, and part of this is because um, the jurisdictions are very complicated. There is a different body responsible for each of the features that I've talked about and some that I haven't had time to talk about. And what we really need is a multi-jurisdictional body that's willing to take a look at deep water and our margins, but all of the deep sea together and start a conversation across these sectors. And th this conversation has to include principles of sustainable development. It has to include the precautionary approach and ecosystem-based management. And it has to uh, involve increased transparency and accountability, which is remarkably absent in many instances of resource exploitation. 
Now we have a host of tools that are out there. There are stewardship tools, things like environmental impact assessments, environmental management plans that the mining companies have to produce. There are sustainable fisheries management tools, different kinds of codes of contact and conduct and best practices. Uh, and we have marine protected areas, although uh, very rarely do we apply this approach, the spatial planning approach in deep water. We're just starting to think about it. And I would suggest we need to think about it some more. But there are other um, tools that maybe we haven't really exploited to the maximum or even started to apply to deep sea. Now, exploration and research can be endless. As I've shown you, we just, there's so much we don't know out there, but we have to learn about connectivity and resilience and diversity in order to be able to be good stewards of that seafloor. We need to think about taking some of the more sophisticated technology and engineering and new advances and uh, including observatories and our deep water observing systems and applying them to some of the steward ish stewardship issues that I've raised. Uh, we need to think about the potential for restoring the deep sea once it's actually been disturbed through trawling or mining. We need to think about the national ocean policy, which in the last version I read mentioned deep water once in the case of Argo floats, but doesn't really acknowledge all those habitats out there that need some consideration. We need to think about MPAs that not only protect the vulnerable habitats we know about, but protect the habitats that we don't know about that we haven't explored or discovered, and then that includes most of the ocean floor, which is rapidly being let out for leases. Uh, and we need to think about multi-sectoral coordinating bodies, as, as I mentioned. Now, these bodies really need to initiate a global conversation, and that can't just be among scientists. The scientists, natural scientists alone, aren't going to solve all the problems out there. We need to be talking to eco economists and policy experts. We need the business community. We need sociologists and people who know about human consumption behavior to engage as well. I think that there are very important public awareness issues. People won't protect what they don't know about, and very few people know about the deep sea that's out there that I've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. Um, so I think education is very important. I think we need to engage the stakeholders um, that are extracting the resources. They need to be part of this dialogue. And we need to build capacity in less developed countries. It turns out that many of the resources, uh, deep sea resources that are being targeted are in countries that don't have any deep sea expertise. They don't have policy people, they don't have deep sea biologists. And we need to export and, or at least help provide education, expertise, and, and technology to go exploring. And then finally, we need to foster the political will around the world to act, for people to actually um, do something about their deep water environments. And so I'm going to leave you with a quote by Verlin Klinkenberg. Uh, it's not how many species we discover, it's how to protect them once we found them and how to keep from destroying the species that we do not know before we have a chance to find them. And I'm also going to give you Christine McVie's very wise words. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for this uh, grand tour through the beauty of uh, life on the seabed, but also its fragility and the issues that have to, do, to deal with uh, how to sustain it into the future. We have uh, some time for questions. Comments? Question. Oh, over here, yep. Yeah. Can you say it again? Yeah, yeah, it already has. And I know that in, in Alaska, the, the, uh, the Pribilof Islands have been subject to pretty much strong depletion of their fisheries and that the 
people there are really arguing hard for conservation areas and marine protection and to close out the fishing to let those stocks rebuild because, um, and, and that's just one example. But I think everywhere that mass fishing has the potential to um, endanger the artisanal fishing that would normally go on. So yes. <laughs> There's another question over here. Well, I think the current understanding is yes, that the source waters off Oregon that are being upwelled have declined in oxygen. So that's one of the changes that's happening. There are also changes in the wind patterns that maybe bring up more of that into shallower water. And I'm actually not totally up to date on what they've discovered recently, but it is probably, it's definitely not related to nutrients from land. It's something going on in the ocean. Yeah. One more. One more? Yes, please. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's all interconnected. I mean, and the long arm of human need is, you know, we need what's in the deep sea. We need to mine for our cell phones and our technology and so on. Um, we need to set up priorities and we need to have the right people talking to each other. It's, it's, as I told you, jurisdictionally, it's very hard. What goes on in EEZs is each country's, you know, problem, but we can help I think that just pulling together information and making it accessible and training people to know about the issues and training environmental lawyers to know about the issues as well as, um, you know, not just the conservation biologists but the natural scientists and everybody and to increase the dialogue is a start. Public awareness is the huge in this, yeah. So I think this, uh, we, we are running out of time, so I would like to thank Lisa one more time. And uh, this uh, concludes this session. <laughs>